ది మహాభారత ఆది పర్వ చాప్టర్ త్రీ మ్యారేజ్ ఆఫ్ దేవయాని వన్ డే దేవయాని వెంట్ ఇన్ టు ది ఫారెస్ట్ అలాంగ్ విత్ ద ప్రిన్సెస్ శర్మిష్ట ద డాటర్ ఆఫ్ ద కింగ్ రిషపర్వ ఫర్ అ పిక్నిక్ యాజ్ ది వర్ స్పోర్టింగ్ ఇన్ ద వుడ్స్ దే వెంట్ టు బే ద ఫుల్ వాటర్స్ ఆఫ్ అ సిల్వన్ పూల్ లీవింగ్ దే గార్మెంట్స్ ఆన్ ద బ్యాంక్ అన్ అన్ఎక్స్పెక్టెడ్ గేల్ బ్లూ ఓవర్ యాజ్ దే వే టేకింగ్ దే బాత్ and the garments were mixed up into a heap after the bath it so happened that princess sharmishta clothed herself in the garments of devyani quite accidentally devyani as she came out missed her clothing and pointed out the impropriety to the princess the conversation which just started half in jest and half in earnest soon assumed the proportions of a fierce controversy the princess proclaimed that her father was the, the supreme head of the state. Devyani was quite conscious of the importance of her father. The princess said that she belonged to the regal class, accustomed to bestow favors on everybody. She reiterated that the father of Devyani was at the receiving end and that he lived on the, on the bounty of the king. But Devyani quite adamantly maintained that her father was superior to the king who must bow down to the feet of the preceptor eventually the asura maidens threw devyani into a dry well and went away leaving her to it. devyani could not and would not come out of the well and remained there sad and sobbing just at that time emperor yayati of the puru race who entered the forest on a hunting expedition came to the same spot in search of water when he peeped into the well he found a lovely maiden instead of water the astonished emperor asked who are you o oh beautiful maiden who is your father how did you fall into this well and why did you not come out devyani replied in a dignified tone i am the daughter of shufai tone i am the daughter of shukracharya who does not know that i have fallen into this well i expect him to come in search of me she was willing to come out and held out her hands yayati chivalrously seized her hand and pulled her out of the well at that time not to enter the capital of rishaparva the father of sharmishta she told the emperor yayati by a happy coincidence you have caught hold of my right hand it tant amounts to marriage you are in every respect quite worthy to be my husband yayati was taken aback at the initiative taken by devyani and he replied you are the daughter of shukracharya renowned throughout the whole world as a great teacher how can a brahmin girl think of marrying a kshatriya like myself revered lady you must first go to your venerable you must first go to your venerable father so saying yayati went his way devyani did not go home but preferred to sit under the shadow of a lonely tree shukracharya sent a woman in search of devyani who was discovered there devyani persisted in her determination not to enter the capital city of rishaparva shukra was much grieved to learn about the sad turn of events he came to devyani and tried to console her enunciating his philosophy shukra says he who conquers himself conquers the and puts up with the abuse of neighbors as an able charioteer who holds the reins firmly in his hand and controls the horses and does not let them go whither they would a worthy person should control his anger he who sheds his anger just as a snake its slough slough is a true hero he who never gets angry is superior to the person who performs a hundred sacrifices ordained by the scriptures he who is balanced and is not perturbed by the trials and tribulations which are common to human life will be a realized soul brothers and sisters servants and friends wife and children will forsake the man of irritable temperament the wise will ignore childish pranks and prattle Devyani did not pay heed to the doctrinaire discourse but put a straight question to her father. 
Is it true? You are a minstrel extolling the glories of the king? Are you a parasite existing on the benevolent grace of his majesty? She told him how arrogant Sharmishta was and how she slapped her and threw her into a dirty ditch. And Devyani wept a ditch. And Devyani wept bitterly. Shukra's reaction was sharp and moved not only by his natural affection towards his daughter but also by wounded pride. He told Devyani, My dear girl, your father does not live on wages of flattery. You are the and Rishaparva himself knows the deep debt of gratitude he owes me. Indra, the king of gods, knows this. No worthy man ever indulges in self-praise. I shall say no more of myself. Let me act and you will know the result. Devyani was very happy at the resolute attitude of her father and added in tender tones, I am indeed a little girl and I should not arrogate to myself the right to advise you. The virtuous should not mix with those who have no sense of decency or decorum. Decency or decorum. My mind is ablaze with the arrogant taunts of Sharmishta. The wounds inflicted by weapons may heal in due course of time. Scales may heal gradually, but wounds inflicted by cruel words remain painful as long as one lives. Went straight to Rishaparva and fixing his eyes gravely on him, he said, O oh King, I am sorry I cannot serve you any longer. Your attendance murdered Kacha many a time. He was a pious pupil who served me with dedication and he was never guilty of any sin. Never guilty of any sin. He was a true brahmachari. I put up with all the affronts very patiently. Now your daughter has insulted and humiliated my daughter, slapping her and pushing her into a well. My daughter refuses to stay any longer in your kingdom. Without her, I cannot go out of your kingdom. The unexpected declaration made by Shukra was a bolt from the blue and Rishaparva protested his complete ignorance of the whole episode. The king said that he would immolate himself in fire if the preceptor chose to depart from his, chose to depart from his realm. But Shukra expressed his utter helplessness in the face of Devyani's resolute will and said that he had no objection if the king could pacify her. So Vrishaparva, with all his retinue, went to the place where Devya was sitting and implored her pardon, throwing himself at her feet in utter supplication. The stubborn Devyani at last was willing to relent on one condition. She demanded that the arrogant Sharmishtha should be made over to her as a slave made for life, should attend on her in the house into which she would be given in marriage. Rishaparva accepted her proposal and sent for Sharmishtha. Sharmishtha arrived and accepted her fault. She said, My father shall not lose the venerable preceptor, the venerable preceptor due to my fault. I am willing to be the maidservant of Devyani for life. Devyani returned to the capital city of King Rishaparva triumphantly. Devyani met Yayati once again when he came on a hunting expedition and repeated her proposal. She told him that her father, the renowned preceptor of the Asuras, would bless them. Yayati followed Devyani and met Sukracharya, who gave his consent to the marriage and Yayati married the dear daughter of the distinguished father. Devyani and Yayati enjoyed a very happy, a very happy married life for a long time. Sharmishtha, of course, followed Devyani to the palace of her husband as the maid-in-waiting. On one occasion, Sharmishtha had an opportunity to meet Yayati in the solitude of the royal garden which reflected her vernal, her vernal bloom. She was not a mere slave girl. Blue blood was flowing in her veins. She revealed her royal lineage to the emperor who had already heard about the exemplary sacrifice she made for the sake of her father and the state. 
Yayati was attracted not only by her charming external personality, but also by the internal beauty of her character. She proved herself to be the great daughter of a little king in sharp contrast to Devyani, the little daughter of a great father. Sharmishtha told Yayati that as she was part and parcel of Devyani as her maid companion, Yayati was pleased with her sweet logic and married her in secret without the knowledge of Devyani. Yayati had five sons, three by Devyani and two by Sharmishtha. One day, Devyani happened, to, Devyani happened to see the two kids who resembled Yayati in the company of their mother. They were taking liberties with their father. Devyani flew into sudden rage and lodged the complaint with her father, Shukra, who cursed Yayati with premature old age. Sensuality and overindulgence invariably lead to premature debility and the curse is a reiteration of the fact. The curse on Yayati was not a boon to Devyani. Devyani, together with Yayati, requested the sage to repeal the, repeal the curse. Shukra said that Yayati could exchange his old age with anyone who was willing to give his youth to him. Yayati called his sons one by one and requested them for the exchange. The eldest son replied, Old age is mocked at by women. The contention of the second son was that old age not only destroyed strength but also sensibility. The third son said that an old man could not ride a horse or walk by himself. Yayati modified his stand and said that he would take back his old age, back his old age after some time and ask the fourth son to accept the liability purely as a temporary measure. He said that an old man required the help of others even to keep his body clean and did not accept the proposal of the father. The fifth said dear to Yayati who begged him with all the earnestness at his command and said he would bestow the kingdom on him while taking back his old age eventually. The fifth one, the fifth son, moved by filial love, accepted the proposal. To the proposal, Yayati regained his youthful vigor and he embraced his son and spent many years in the enjoyment of sensual pleasures. He was in the garden of Kubera for some time in the company of an Apsara maiden. At long last, Yayati realized that realized that sensual desire was never quenched by indulgence any more than fire by pouring ghee over it. He came back to Puru and took back his old age. Puru regained his youth. Yayati retired to the forest, bestowing the kingdom on Puru. They disinherited the Yadavas, the Bhojas, Yavanas and Mlechas were their descendants.